I was pondering something in the shower today. Okay. It was after I got home from work. <laughs> okay. I was washing the uh, stank oh, of the uh, work day off sure, of my body. Sure, sure you were. Sure you. That's what you were washing <laughs> when you were having this deep thought. I wouldn't say it's a deep thought. <laughs> I'm going to have to ask you this question, Spencer. How often... You shower every day, I would imagine. Yeah. How often do you actually soap and lather and wash your legs? Legs? Below the penis and balls and all that stuff. Like Below the danger them. zone. Yeah. Say upper quad. Like, like actually get in there? Yeah, upper quad to feet. How, Pro- probably not as much as I as I should. Right? I was I, thinking that. I, 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 at least I always try to give the feet a good once over, but just because of all the sweat. Like, yeah, you know what I, I get mean? that. But yeah, but yeah, yeah, anything below the knee probably doesn't get as as much of a good scrub. Yeah, because I should. I was using the, my manly body wash. That's not at all the woman's body <laughs> wash because I was out. <laughs> Smelling like roses and vanilla and lavender and anyway, so I was washing as I do and got the old you know the <laughs> in the butt crack. Yeah, just my bare hand <laughs> raw like a animal hey it used to be worse back in the day they used to just use bar soap and then wash their face <laughs> you know little kid goes in after his dad just washes his asshole and just washes his face with the raw bar soap use a loofah yeah um but i was washing and i looked down and you know i'm blonde so my hair is not real dark yeah but my legs they still got you know solid hair on my legs yeah and i was thinking like I barely wash these motherfuckers like if i get dirt on me at work i'll wash them and like you said i'll do the feet but I don't just, like, soap up my legs all the time. And women, they shave, so they usually probably, yeah. you know. Yeah, have to, yeah. But I don't. And I was thinking, I bet no man does. Most men probably do not wash their legs adequately. But I feel like my legs are always the cleanest part of my body. They never look gross. And then I was looking at, like, the hairline. And it's very weird how we're designed as, yeah. as men. Yeah. I mean, there's obviously your fucking Robin Williams type just yeah, hair all over. Yeah, dudes. But for the most part, like me... My hair, like my legs are hairy, goes up to the quad and it's hairy, yeah. stops right below the ass cheek, and just smooth baby ass, but the crack is like yeah. a forest, like just a black Cthulhu jungle of love. <laughs> like, it's bad. And I was like, why Why is that? And then, you know, the crotch is a little hairy. Yeah. I mean, nor, not anything abnormal, but like the ass yeah. hair. The, but just in the middle, not on the, the smooth baby cheeks. The, the ass is always the worst for some reason, it seems like. Yeah. Like, the one place where you would, wouldn't want any hair that, that <laughs> involves your ass is where it's all at. Like, I feel like if I was a gay man, I feel like. My uh, partner would be very disappointed if you first met me. Well, I'm pretty sure if you were a gay man, you'd probably have it all wet. Yeah, yeah. it would be all kind of clean, I'd imagine. Yeah, nobody's get, going near my BH, but nope. if uh, but if you wanted him to, like that's work. Get up in that ass. I, I just I don't understand why the hair goes there. And then it's like you know you have hair on your arms, but yeah. and then, like, some I, like, people get hair all the way up to the neck from oh, the dude, arm. That's there's, weird. There's this dude who like his at work. You might remember him from overnight, but like his chest hair, like literally goes up and then into like his the neck of the facial hair. Like there's no just connects. Yeah, so like it's weird when he shaves, and then I think when he shaves, he has like because it's enough to wear like a normal shirt. It's coming out of it, like it's coming, Ooh. it's popping out of the top of a normal t-shirt. There was a guy I saw on the internet. He had like the beard, like the super lined up black eye beard almost, but he's yeah. like probably i would imagine some kind of like arab or something like he was like a middle eastern guy because they have like great hair genetics when it comes to beard growth but he had it all lined up but his beard connected to the bottom of his neckline and wrapped around his head like a upside down halo it was kind of <laughs> cool but it was weird and then like it's and then his cyber connected but it was just like below the ear was bald until it got to the hairline I was like, why how, why'd weird- you do that doesn't make sense but you bring up a good point like that's the one thing about sex about like white dude hair is just be- like unless if you can get like that grizzly like mountain man thing going on but like you can't get like a good fresh edge up and like look all like you can't get it lined up without no. looking like a douche no i was always disappointed in life because i'm blonde and even though like my hair has real blonde streaks in it but it's more of like i would say like a dirty blonde yeah but my beard, as you can see, is fucking damn near white blonde. Yeah. But I cannot grow like a Brock Lesnar beard. Because Brock Lesnar is super, super blonde. 
almost white hair, but that motherfucker grow a Viking you, beard. You just want a flesh beard? Yeah, so I clearly did not get Viking genetics. I just got, like, shitty Hungarian genetics well, or something. I got, I got my, uh... I don't know if you ever noticed whenever my facial hair grows out, especially if it's caught in a certain light, it gets that red tint to it. Yeah. Have you noticed that, that the, the old the old Irish there kicking That's in? That's what my brother gets. He gets the red tint, and it's like, dude, you're not even a redhead. That doesn't yeah, make like, sense. people are like, oh, you dye your hair. And I'm like, no, what? Well, you, your beard's red. I'm like, so, like, that doesn't... Have you not ever met, like, an Irish person before? Like... So, and I'm not even like that Irish. Yet. Like it's not like I'm super. I like like there's like my grandfather or, on my dad's side is, but like it's not like I'm full blown Irish. Like I'm from Boston. Yeah, there's just all kinds of things sprinkled in your DNA. Yeah, man. same with mine. But he, again, we don't get like cool genetics. No, though. like we're not super tall. Don't easily get muscular. Don't have cool facial hair. No. Oh, and th- th- speaking of super mu- muscular, did you did you see people making fun of Jason Momoa's dad bod recently? Yeah, I posted about that because that. Oh, I didn't. Even, I didn't. I see don't that. ever get upset about celebrity gossip for the most part, mm-hmm. but that infuriated me because I'm like, why is like Jason Momoa who's vacation dad bod yeah. is better than 90% of people's right. normal bodies and they're they were shaming him like what fat fuck cheeto eater is sitting there shaming him like oh look at this fucking tubby he wasn't even tubby he just wasn't flexing no, he's yeah, like, yeah. Big- like he was like it was like relaxing like cause you can't stay at that aquaman like all the time i want you to be at six percent body fat all the time who cares if your brain's not functioning and then, properly and then i even heard like a rumor that it might even be for like a, a movie or something too like mm-hmm. you know that he put on a little extra weight which you just like he didn't even put on weight it was just like hey don't work out for two weeks he literally just looked like he just uh drank a bunch of water and was just kind of puffed out yeah. that's it like, he's, you can still see loaded. the outlines of all his muscles like what who is judging this guy yeah i'm sure if he still flexed at you like that shit would still pop out speaking of buff celebrities this might excite you because <laughs> i didn't i never even thought about it method man yeah is pushing to play bishop Ooh. In the new X-Men, okay. if, if you go on his Instagram, he's been uh, tagging Marvel, and he's trying to get all his fans to tag Marvel, and he's getting super jacked in the gym. I'm going to say, now, is he willing to wear the Jerry curl, though? If they, if I they think decide he, to go classic Bishop? I think he posted a picture of it. Oh, okay. Yeah. We'll get, you know, we should just get into this episode. Fans yeah, don't yeah, want to yeah, hear yeah, about yeah. this. No. Fans, look up Method Man Bishop if you're interested. We'll get into the writing episode, and uh, during this nice musical break, I want you to just think about... How often you wash your legs? Because that's important. We have music? Oh, yeah. Intro music. Bring it to me. What's up? Oh, what's up? I didn't realize this was a 90s episode. <laughs> what's up? <laughs> Hey, you are listening to the Drunken Pen Writing Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had like a big, long Gene Simmons tongue. I'd just be licking everything. I am your host, Caleb James. With me, I didn't give you a name today. Oh, What are you drinking there? Uh, an, an, an Orange Crush. Orange Crush. The Croatian Crush hey. Church. There All you right, go. Yeah, Spencer, the Croatian Crush. It's All like right. old wrestler name. Yeah, right. Yeah, I'm like fly, that. You find out the top tone bucker. Yeah. So if anybody doesn't think I come up with these off the top of my head, I quite often do. Today's episode is probably going to be way, way more sophisticated than that intro. Let on <laughs> <laughs> that long seven minute intro about washing and other I feel, stuff. I feel like the people who I feel bad for the people who like will kind of listen to this for some kind of rating thing, and they're just like, "What? What is this? I'm done. I'm I'm not. I'm done with this episode." We're like thirty something episodes into the main episode you, podcast format, so I think they know what they're getting you, into. You, they don't. You, you would hope so. I thought about going back and re uh, editing the original episodes we posted because they get a lot of views. And that's not a good representation of us because they sound so shitty. <laughs> I think I can go back and just like fix them up audio wise and then okay. re upload them. Uh, that's work. That's almost kind of like going back and rewriting like a story that you published a while ago. Yeah. So you just rather do something new. It's just, you know, because like how we listen when we get a new podcast, you listen to a current episode, you like it, but then, then you, you go, go back, back to the original. And it's like, and well, working, working your way through the backlog. Sometimes it's rough. 
And then, but like, the, I almost kind of like that, like, yeah. to see, like, the where, progression. Like, yeah, the progression and how things came about and stuff like that. I think we only had, like, five episodes that sounded pretty shitty anyway. I think yeah. after then we started getting better. Anyway, today's episode, Ray Bradbury's Greatest Writing Advice. And uh, there's a lot of Ray Bradbury fans. I don't know if I read too much of his work, though. I know I've read some of his short stories, but I don't think I read any of his novels. Let me see what his most see, famous one is. I have not. I mean, we all uh, know about Fahrenheit 451, but I have not read that. The Martian Chronicles, Dandelion Wine, The Illustrated Man, Something Wicked This Way, Wicked Comes This Way, Well, The Sound of Thunder. He's a very prolific man. Yeah. But he knows what he's talking about. Uh, fucking leave me alone. Somebody, somebody texted me. Non-sexy things. That's what happens, Spencer, when you're in a relationship for a very long time. You don't get sexy text but, messages anymore. You don't get sex pics. You don't get anything. You know what you get? We need to hang out the garbage. You know, they are like the grocery list. Or, yeah. We need milk. Milk and eggs. Milk and eggs. Always with the milk and eggs. I don't even like any of these things. <laughs> ah, my life is bullshit. Caleb, stop flipping the table. Mm-hmm. That's the thing. Can't even rage out in peace because you get yelled at for raging <laughs> out. I'm just gonna go sit in the bedroom. We need to talk. Oh, <laughs> I think your your only Silas would be to just go into the shitter for as long as you can get away with it. That doesn't work. At some point, though, at some point they just open up on the door. Just, oh, let me in! What are you doing in there for so long? I know you're not pooping. <laughs> I don't hear anything. They're out loud. I'm cleaning the bathroom. You're not cleaning. I always have to fucking clean it. <laughs> I just actually, got it real a little bit. <laughs> actually, I don't deal with those kind of problems too often. <laughs> the only thing I ever get yelled at about is taking out the garbage. It's always something, but I feel like there's many guys who have it much worse. Oh, yeah. Anyway, get back to Mr. Ray Bradbury, because nobody wants to hear about us getting yelled at by ladies. Unless you're into that kind of thing. I mean, there are some people that That's like to get yelled at. That's a different podcast, guys. <laughs> S and M in the morning. <laughs> Whoa! That's how you start your day. How start the day? Whips and chains and butt plugs. Always with the butt plugs. All right. This article from LitHub.com, written by Miss Emily Temple. Shout out to you, Emily Temple. Um, I'm not gonna read her long intro here. I'm just gonna hop right in. She doesn't have this in list format. I know how much that enrages you, Spencer. But she does have titles. Mm. I mean, I'm okay with just titles. As long as you have something to break it up. True. Yeah, as long as and, it's not and, just and how could, how could how could I how could I uh, hate the the list format? Because oh, what are you saying? Because it wasn't in a list. Because it's not in a list. Because yeah, the greatest thing that I've ever wrote to date has been uh, has been a list. That's gonna go on your tombstone. It is. Wrote this shitty article. <laughs> 2018. <laughs> Quantity creates quality. That's an inter- that's an interesting take in my yeah. opinion. Let's read on. The best hygiene for beginning writers or intermediate writers is to write a hell of a lot of short stories. That is what we started doing, yeah. and I agree full-heartedly yeah. with that. If you can write one short story a week, it doesn't matter what the quality is to start, but at least you're practicing. And at the end of the year, you have 52 short stories. Well, damn. Mm. And I defy you to write 52 bad ones. That is true. Yeah. Unless you really suck. <laughs> yeah. It's hard to be that sucky. <laughs> Can't be done. At the end of 30 weeks or 40 weeks or at the end of the year, all of a sudden a story will come that's just wonderful. Even if you only had one good story out of that, that's one good story. Yeah. And for a new writer who's just learning the process, that is muy bueno. That's yeah. good. That's what you want. This is from... Telling the Truth, the keynote address of the 6th Annual Writer's Symposium by the Sea, sponsored by Point Loma Nazarene University 2001. Did not think I was going to have to read a big chunk like that. I never read the word symposium. I don't think I like that. Good, good job. Better than that one word you could have you pronounced a couple episodes ago. I don't remember what that was. Yeah, I, couldn't, I just remember you having trouble. <laughs> oh, yeah, that one. <laughs> Fuck that word. That wasn't a real word. If I can't read it, it's not a real word. Symposium by the Sea sounds like something I'd like to go to. It just sounds fancy. Yeah. Sounds like you gotta wear like a really cool hat 
and you have to have, but you don't actually wear the hat inside, obviously. Yeah, you no. give it to the doorman Dude. with your coat and yeah. hangs it up. Or is there a coat man? I think there's a coat check man. No, how many symposiums you've been to, but it's. I've been to about 13. Pretty Thir- big deal. 13. 13. I mean, I wasn't invited to any yeah, of them. But I showed up. Just walked in off the street like a hobo in the night. Next up, get to the big truth first. A novel has all kinds of pitfalls because it takes longer and you are around people. And if you're not careful, you will talk about it. The novel is also hard to write in terms of keeping your love intense. It's hard to stay erect for 200 days. <laughs> True. <laughs> yeah. So get the big truth first. If you get the big truth, the small truth will accumulate around it. Let them be magnetized to it, drawn to it, and then cling to it. From a 2010 interview with Sam Weller published in the Paris Review. I... I definitely think that um, that was my problem when I was writing, like, work started on that one novel. Yeah. I started with what I was really passionate about in the story, but because, you know, obviously novel's pretty long, I got burnt out and ended up, we did other projects, and I kind of let that fall to the wayside. And I think if I really would have hit the big marks of the story first and what I wanted to tell... Even if I took a break, I could have went back and worked around it, the other little smaller stuff, and it might not have been too much of a problem to finish. I mean, yeah, that seems like a legitimate thing. I haven't... That's the next thing that I'm tackling, is going to try to tackle within my writing process, it is a novel-length kind well, of story. Even with uh, shorter stories, um, your Daily Rounds, for example, yeah. I mean, that was, you know, close to novella length. Yeah. So with that... You came up with the idea, and you had kind of where you were going along the way already set out before you started writing. So I would say that was your truth there. That's what you were hitting. Yeah. Everything else was just fleshing out the story. If you can hit those central themes of what you want to get to. Those big story beats that are what you spend the time building to. That's why I don't really outline, but I do a story arc. So I'll do where the story starts, where the middle is, what the climax is, and what the ending's going to be. Assuming I know the ending, I'll at least come up with a rough idea of the ending. Or at least what you think it's going to be. Yeah, that way, especially when you get to that, you know, sloggy middle part that's hard to write, you don't uh, get stuck because you know where it's going. So even if you're like, I can't fucking write this, like five days go by and you're just like, I can't make myself write this. You can go, but I do like the ending and I know yeah. where that is. Maybe I'll just write that and then I'll find out how I get there. Yeah. I do that uh, quite often in my story, so... And that seems to work with some success. Next up, don't think too hard. Oh, shit. The yes, in- sir. Yeah, third. Not a problem, Mr. <laughs> Bradbury. I won't think ever. The intellect is a great danger to creativity because you begin to rationalize and make up reasons for things. Instead of staying with your own basic truth, who you are, what you are, what you want to be, I've had a sign over my typewriter for over 25 years now which reads, Don't think. You must never think at the typewriter. You must feel. Your intellect is always buried in the, that feeling anyway. From a 1974 interview with James Day. I think that kind of goes along with... What was his name? I, it eludes me. Stephen Kotler, I think. He's the flow state writer. He, you know, he was on Rogan a couple times. He wrote about... Uh, like creativity and how to get into flow states and things like that. But I bring him up because one of the things he does in his personal writing, he wakes up at an ungodly hour in the morning and like gets a cup of coffee and immediately goes to writing before he's fully awake because that way he's not thinking. He's just yeah. in that creative mindset. And I kind of like that idea. Um, when I write, when I have the biggest problems or go through funks, it's always because I'm thinking too much. Yeah. If I could just sit down and write. That's why, like, if you'd had me be like, hey, Caleb, write a flash fiction right now. Write a short story right now and just throw out a random idea. I could do it no problem because I don't know anything about it or where it's going. I just come up with it. But when I have the story already thought up and then I start writing it and then I put it off and then I go back to writing it, I'm thinking too much. And that kind of derails the process. So definitely keep your brain in check yeah if you can just kind of if you have your notes set to the side i would say start writing 
follow the notes or guidelines you might have, but just free flow, like sweet yeah. jazz. Even, even if you just like start on like a blank document and just write something to get the ju- ju- uh, juices flowing and then go back to whatever you were originally, you know, writing. Right. And obviously this isn't going to work for every writer because there's some who have to have strict outlines yeah. and really have things planned out. That's fine too if that works for you. But like I said, sweet jazz, just let that improvisation flow like Spencer on the toilet just flow okay don't write towards a moral uh oh I don't know man I I mean I like my morals you have morals? I don't have them oh you just say oh okay like writing about them I like, you know, fantasy. Oh, all right. <laughs> Things you can't that. understand because you don't have human emotions. That, that sounds more accurate. Okay. <laughs> My robot brain. <laughs> Trying to write a cautionary story is fatal. You m- Why is that in brackets? <laughs> you must never do that. A lot of lousy novels come from people who want to do good. The do-gooder novel. The ecological novel. And if you tell me you're doing a novel or a film about how a woodsman spares a tree, I'm not going to go see it for a minute. (laughs) From a 1995 interview with Playboy. That is actually pretty good advice because I I never really thought about it. But if you set out, and I see this a lot on uh, from Twitter writers, why they can't sell their work is because they set out to write, say, super pro trans book or... Mm -hmm. uh, you know, gay rights book or whatever it is, if you're focused too hard on that and the storytelling comes second, you're going to have problems. Yeah. You yeah. want to tell a good story. And if it has a moral, great. And if there's an overall moral, say, you know, gay rights or something, that's fine. And that's uh, the fans will like that. But if that's what you're going into. If it's just like shoehorned in there not properly yeah you're just trying to put out almost your ideology you might sell that to the people who are really hardcore into your ideology but you're not gonna i don't think succeed like we were talking off air about uh sleeping beauties from stephen king and owen owen king i said i read some of the reviews and a lot of people were hating on the book because it had a lot of feminist themes and like i said neither of us read it yet so we can't really judge but I'm wondering what if that was the case? Like what if he went, you know, they went into that with that, that moral already in place. Like, Hey, this is what we're going to write about. We're going to focus on what the world would be like if women were asleep or whatever the story's about. Maybe that, uh, maybe that helped tank the book if it didn't, I don't know if it did well or not, honestly, but that's always, uh, a pitfall a writer must avoid. Don't put yourself too deep into the book, your ideology. That is keep it, I would say you want to insert yourself in your ideas into your work, but you don't want the reader to go, oh, this is just the author's opinion on yeah, everything. Yeah, you don't want to be, you don't want to make it so blatant that they can tell it's just you throwing what your thoughts are into the story. Yeah. Th- and, and that just opens you, opens you up too, because like, I don't know about you, but I always say whenever somebody talks about like a story and they're like, oh, that actually meant for this and that represented whatever, you know? Yeah. And it's like, when you, if you're doing that kind of stuff, like with the mores, that just opens it up more for that. Like it, it can it just be a story. Can just, just tell a like good an- story. That's all I want. Just focus on the storytelling first. That's the main thing to take away. <laughs> Writer's block is just a warning that you're doing the wrong things. What if you have a blockage and you don't know what to do about it? Laxative. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's obvious <laughs> It's obvious you're doing the wrong thing, aren't you? You're being warned, aren't you? Your subconscious is saying, I don't like you anymore. You're writing about things I don't give a damn for. If you have writer's block, you can cure it this evening by stopping what you're doing and writing something else. You pick the wrong subject. From telling the truth, the keynote address, uh, that's way too much to read. Another symposium by the sea. I somewhat agree with that, but I will say there's times where my writer's block has nothing to do with the work, actually. Yeah. There's a lot of times where it's either just exhaustion, it's um, maybe I'm just not feeling the story at the moment because it's beyond just what my a, current creativity levels. Just in a bad mood. Yeah, like I'm just not able to get to it at the time. Because there's a lot of things, uh, what was it? One of the recent longer stories I wrote, it was probably close to novella length. 
I could have easily bailed on it because I wasn't feeling it for a good chunk. But after a couple months, I went back and almost with fresh eyes and I was reinvigorated and went back and with gusto and finished it. So I don't think you should necessarily abandon things. If I uh, no story left behind, yeah, it's, I mean it's a shitty story. Well, if it's a shitty story, yes, but <laughs> but I would just say uh, take that advice with a grain of salt. I mean, I mean, he might be right. He writes fucking good books. I don't know. And true, like, and that just might be like, uh, like I mentioned earlier, if you're having a, you know, write a block on one thing, start something else. That might give get your, you know, get your ideas flowing and stuff like that, and then. You can go back to the thing you were stuck on with this new energy and... Yeah, that's what I usually do when I get that... Uh, sometimes, again, if you're writing something that takes you in a direction that gets more murky and complicated than you expected, and uh, say you're writing a sci-fi story and you hit a, a hard chunk of the story where you have to get real technical, mm. and you're just not in that frame of mind, yeah. well, if you go into a short story or something like you said, just take a little break and work on something else... Maybe because that's easier, you can you knock that out with you know fairly quickly, and then you're feeling good about yeah. yourself. You're more motivated. Then you can go back and actually tackle the harder work. Because sometimes writing is just hard. Yeah. Sometimes you're telling a story and you get to some part that's difficult. Maybe you just it's not the story that's hard. It's the way you're trying to tell the story that's not working. Or you got to something and you're like, I did not do enough research on this thing. I don't feel like spending like two hours reading about this thing. Like, I just yeah, I that's, can't. Yeah, that gets me. Like, the story I'm working on now about, uh, you know, the devil in Tokyo. One part that uh, the, this week I've been working on it, but I'm not doing, um, I would say, great speed with it. Because I had to start looking up hotels in Tokyo and street addresses. And just trying to fucking make sure I'm, you know, when I'm talking about Tokyo, it's like realistic. And uh, that was kind of boring, so that threw me for a little bit. But once I got in the right mind frame again, I went back and I knocked all that out. So now if you read it, you could actually look up these places and go, oh, this is a real street. So just things like that sometimes are really the boring stuff. Yeah. that's Sometimes it's not writer's block. It's just the boring stuff you don't feel like doing. Uh, write what you love. Fall in love and stay in love. I think this would also help your writer's block. If yeah. you're writing something you're really passionate about, you might not get stuck. Do what you love. Don't do anything else. Don't write for money. Write because you love to do something. If you write for money, you won't write anything worth reading. From a 2002 interview with Brendan Dolling, published in public libraries. I want your loves to be multiple. I don't want you to be a snob about anything. Anything you love, you do it. It's got to be with a great sense of fun. Writing is not a serious business. It's a joy and a celebration. You should be having fun at it. Ignore the authors who say, Oh my God, what work? Oh, Jesus Christ, you know? No, to hell with that. It is not work. If it's work, stop it and do something else. From telling the truth, the keynote address at the 6 a.m. Symposium by the Sea, blah, blah, blah. He did a lot of fucking good info at that Symposium by the Sea. Yeah. Um, this actually goes along with a thread I had on Twitter did it, uh, today that a lot of people, a lot of people were fucking commenting on. I was like, I was having trouble keeping up. I asked about quitting, which we talked about in the past, about when or if anyone's quit their day job to become a full-time writer. And a, uh, a big part of it was most people obviously didn't or yeah. they want to. That's the dream, obviously, is that they want to. But some have and they struggled. And the main thing is writing for money. Yeah. And I, I've always said if you write for money, you're writing for the wrong reasons. Yeah. I mean, obviously, we want to get rich and famous off of writing. That would be the dream. That's the goal. But that's not, like, why we write. If that's what, like, if you're a painter and you're only painting because you want to sell in galleries and make millions of dollars, you're a douche. Yeah. <laughs> like, you're not, you well, want somebody to have passion yeah. for what they're doing. And well, there's always that tricky bad balance that we talk, we've talked about before that, yes, it shouldn't be a job, but you need to treat it. Like, a, you, you know, you need yeah. to treat it like your job, especially if you're going for that full-time, like, writer, like, to make a living off of it. Yes, you want to do what what you love, and you want to have it be your art and represent you, but you also, you're going to have to take that, like, five-hour chunk out of the day. Not all, no, granted, maybe not all together, maybe you do two hours here, two hours there, one more hour at night, or something like that, but you have to put in that steady time and that work... You know, like the same you'd put in, you know, uh, you know, painters put in like hours and hours of time into one painting. 
it, you have to treat your writing like your day job where even when you don't feel like doing it you have to you you know if you don't work you're not going to be able to live you're not going to have food you're not going to have a place to live these are very important things yes. well if you treat your writing like that but you're actually passionate and enjoy your writing unlike your day job well, some people like their day job most i don't i don't know anyone those assholes yeah <laughs> but if you treat your writing like your day job but go into it with that passion you have for because it's something you love that's when you really accomplish major goals and that's i would say like a stephen king obviously he was he failed more than he succeeded when he first started yeah. But it was because he loved writing and he treated it like a job that he was able to uh, hit that next level and become famous and stuff. Because a lot of writers I see, while they love writing, they don't like putting in the work. Like I saw um, an interview, I think it's probably from a couple years ago, and it was just a clip, a clip but I guess like uh, him and... Uh, uh, George R. R. Martin like had like a yeah, they were both on stage. Yeah, and, I watch that. Yeah, and I think it was towards the end where he, like and George R. R. Martin asked Stephen King like how he could write so goddamn much or so fast, and he's like he was talking about like you know like he puts in his time and like he's like however long it takes me, he's like I get at least like six pages in a day, and that that's a lot of fucking writing right there. I've seen some controversy recently over that topic because. I guess the uh, the new way of thinking for a lot of writers is um, we all write at different speeds and different Wait, styles yeah, and stuff. Yeah, yeah. But the thing, like the main thing, and it was a I forget who it was, but it was a pretty famous writer, not like a Neil Gaiman, but lo- level below that. But they were talking about how uh, it was some bullshit Twitter thread, so they get people to like them. But I feel like it was um, feeding into. No, I want. I don't want to say failures, but even people like me who can't, you know, just don't write every day, even though I want to. It was like, well, you you don't have to write every day. You shouldn't think like that. And just because you don't write every day doesn't mean you're a failure. Write at your own speed. But at the same time, like we were talking about, if you treat it like your job yeah. and do it every day, eventually that'll become a habit and it'll become a routine, and then you will get more work out there and it'll be uh, more comfortable and then eventually that'll be your new norm. And if you don't do it that often, you're not going to ever have anything to give to any... To, you won't have anything written to try to get published anywhere if you're just like, oh, well, I'll do it when, when, when I do it. I know if I don't write every day, even if it's just for a few minutes every day, I will end up going two weeks without writing anything. Yeah. And I'm useless and, oh. and I fall into the I fall into bad habits quicker and, than I fall and, into good ones. And that's always in the back of your head while you're doing whatever you're doing, you're like, I could be I could be writing right now. I should be writing. It right gives now. you like an anxiety and I know you probably experience it because I fucking do all the time. Mm. Like and again, a lot of it comes to just my day job being exhausting and shit. But that's no excuse. I will come home and I'll start like watching YouTube videos or something stupid. And I'm like, well, I should be writing now. So I'll like turn off my phone and go, okay, well, I'm going to write and I'll get the computer out. And I was like, oh, uh, hmm. I'll wait till like 6.15. That's a yeah. good 10 minutes away. That'll get me. And I'll just keep doing that. So you I don't give myself, no, give myself a little break. Like I had a hot day today. Yeah. I need, I need like 10 minutes to decompress. <laughs> And then I end up not only not writing, but then I'm not I don't even end up watching the YouTube videos yeah. either. So I didn't accomplish anything. No. So I just let like the anxiety of not writing just ruin everything and I could have just fucking just I should have just start writing. Yeah. If you just start writing, even if it sucks ass, I I would say I'm I'm cuz I fell off of that for a minute cuz whatever that one guy was saying, I forget who it was. It might have been a couple of people that were talking about that taking, you know, not having to write every day, write at your own and like uh, Dirk Manning even said that about his work, he uh, doesn't write; he writes in gigantic chunks, and then. Well, and that, and what that goes into, um, well, that's different though. That's his scheduled writing time. That's not it's a planned. Yeah, it's not a. Oh well, I'll get to it when I get to it. He's like, I know I'm gonna have. I can't forget what he said, but like, say, like he has the three days out of, out of the week to write. So he uses those he, whole three yeah, days, he, and he uses like he gets what he can out of the most of those, and then whatever his I don't know if it's his day job or marketing the books or because that's another thing that is always forget about. Like, oh, you write it, but then you got to market it, yeah, and shit like that. That's, but a, that's a whole nother episode. Yeah, we should do one on next. People have been asking me questions, by the way, but um, like we know. Yeah, you brought up a really good point with that though. It's, it's not exactly writing every day. It's the, the idea of that. It's write in, with a schedule. Yeah. 
So you might not be um, able to write every day or maybe you just don't work like that. But if you schedule your writing to when you can and actually follow that schedule, that's what you should really be doing. So if you only write Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, make sure you write Thursday, Friday, and Saturday and then that you're fine. You're not going to feel shitty. You don't have to actually write every day. It's more of the idea of just being consistent. Yeah. Read these three things every night. What you've got to do from this night forward is stuff your head with more different things from various fields. I'll give you a program to follow every night. Very simple program. For the next thousand nights, geez, before you go to bed every night, read one short story. That'll take you 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Okay, then read one poem a night from the vast history of poetry. Stay away from most modern poems. It's crap. It's not poetry. It's not poetry. I've been saying this for fucking years. I'm so glad that goddamn Ray Bradbury agrees with me because it's not poetry. It's garbage. Nothing rhymes. Everything's stupid. You're just making up words and you're throwing them on the page and they get published in these literary no- uh, magazines and people are like, oh, it's amazing. It's not. So it's like the Little Wayne of poetry? It's crap. Yes, Little Wayne. Right. I'm glad we're the only two people that hate Little Wayne in this whole state because everybody else fucking loves him. I don't get Well, my brother hates him too. So. Doesn't like it. But it's a good man. Good man. Okay. Now, if you want to kid yourself and write lines that look like poems, go ahead and do it, but you'll go nowhere. Read the great poets. Go back and read Shakespeare. Read Alexander Pope. Read Robert Frost. But one poem a night, one short story a night, one essay a night for the next thousand nights from various fields, archaeology, zoology, biology, all the great philosophers of time, comparing them. Read the essays of Aldous Huxley. Read Lauren Isley, great anthropologist. I want you to read essays in every field. On politics, analyzing literature, pick your own. But that means that every night then, before you go to bed, you're stuffing your head with one poem, one short story, one essay. The end of a thousand nights? Jesus God, you'll be full of stuff, won't you? From telling the truth, keynote address of the six animals posing by the sea. Damn. Yeah, no wonder why these are hard to read because it's all fucking somebody recorded him speaking yeah. I guess a lecture that's man, that's hard <laughs> that's a lot <clears throat> that's a lot for the most part I do read every night usually just whatever novel I'm yeah. reading oh yeah it's not the reading part I got that reading part down yeah and uh, I do read I'm so you're kind of big into the poetry not I don't know big but you I hate poetry yes <laughs> I don't read poetry I read it for the site when I post it, and mm. I fucking will write it, but I don't like writing it. I When I was younger, I was into poetry and stuff, mainly like Edgar Allan Poe stuff, but then when I hit modern poetry, I'm like, oh, this is trash, and now I just, I'm not a big poetry guy. But I think we should follow this to the T, Spencer. Where you think he- you'd run out of shit eventually. <laughs> Short stories, fine. Essays, uh, what are the essays we're reading? Could it be like a New Yorker article? Does it have like, to be a straight... Like, I don't know. Like, <clears throat> like an actual essay that I read. Actually, there's a website I follow that has uh, like classic short stories on them. And it tells you how many minutes uh. each story is to read, like our site does. Yes. So maybe I'll send you the link to that. Okay. And you could like read some shorter ones yeah. from time to time. But the essays... Like in the poetry, poetry, I don't... I feel like when I read poetry anymore, I'm not really reading it you're just going through the motions just looking at it the words go in my brain but they're not developing anything i mean there's some good like dylan thomas or like older poets that i like like i'll actually take something away from that but modern poetry no but what about the essays are we gonna do that spencer every before bed yeah who has no how much fucking time do you have ray bradbury i don't got five hours before bed (laughs) right i can spend that five hours sleeping (laughs) yeah but just do Audible, okay? Can I listen to an essay? Does that count? I mean, I get what he's saying, though. You want to fill your head with, dip, like, all angles. Now, maybe if you did, like, eat, like, like one night you did a short story, one night you did an essay. Yeah. Uh, like, but to do all three each night? Jesus. I I like where he's coming from. And I would say, like, we could probably both do better by reading more philosophy and stuff that yeah. we could actually incorporate into our writing. And, I mean, I do read philosophy from time to time. Um, I just, I don't know about the goddamn essays, man. I have to be in the mood for an essay. And then it also has to be something I give a shit about. Yeah, like everything he just said, like zoology, archaeology. You know what? Fuck that. When was it? Hold on. 2001 is when he fucking was at this symposium. So you know what? I say our essays are covered by the podcast we listen to by now. 
Because uh, that yeah. wasn't a thing, but that's the same yeah. thing. Yeah. Like, you listen to a Dan Carlin hardcore history, yeah. that's a goddamn lecture. Yeah. I feel like lectures could replace the essay part, and I do that every single day. I think I'm good. But, so, like, I mean, what podcast are you listening to? Like, the, 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 does the Brogan fall into that? Does that cover that kind of category? Sometimes, depending yeah. on who's on. You don't listen to Dan Carlin? No. They're really I, long. I, They're, like, four hours. Yeah. And then, like, I never catch them, like, the new ones to, like, and then, like, because, like, it's like series, are, and you have to like pay for them too. Sometimes they they're on pod, uh, like the podcast apps. It's just oh. I think it's newer ones you pay for. Yeah. It's only like a dollar, and I think it, yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's not like it's expensive. Well, I it's think just, Rogan even said if you like just message him or something, he just give them to you for free. He doesn't care. But um, I listen to a Japanese podcast abroad in Japan. It's a British dude that lives in Japan. But that's more entertainment. There's just lots of fucks and shits and dicks. I listen to... uh I'm trying to think of what... The Jocko podcast isn't really... Mm. I mean, he goes into the military stuff. I haven't listened to him recently because I got burnt out with that. I, liked, I, don't, I don't like Jocko. I liked when he talked about uh, Miyamoto Masashi and his like philosophy and he had a couple episodes on that. That was really cool. That's why I download, you know, downloaded yeah. his podcast. Or subscribe to it rather, and then he uh, he just start talking about military and killing people. I'm like, all right, I'm not waking up four thirty in the morning doing clean and jerks. Like, <laughs> <laughs> fuck you guys. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I'm not posting pictures of my watch at four a.m. every day <clears throat> on Instagram. I uh, follow. I'm trying to think, what is the other podcast? I, there's at least one educational. I follow a couple writing podcasts that are kind of essayist. I would say. Regardless, I, th- I think podcasts replace mm. the essay. Yeah, there's definitely not. Definitely ones out there you could find. I think it's just the information yeah. is the main thing to get. And then the short stories, I would say, for writing styles and stuff. things Because uh, I definitely focus on writing styles when I read short stories, which is why I like them. Whereas a novel, I usually get drawn into the novel too yeah. far to like actually... Unless it's like a really weird style or something, I, you kind of just forget about what the what's like the style or how it was written. You just get sucked into the story. All right. Oh, perfect segue. Next up, style is truth. Style is truth. Once you nail down what you want to say about yourself and your fears in your life, then that becomes your style when you go to those writers who can teach you how to use words to fit your truth. From a 2010 interview with Sam Weller, Paris Review. Uh, yeah, no. I think this is one of the troubles that uh, that I, like, one of the things I have trouble with is... Uh, Developing your own style? Yeah. I think, I, I feel like the kind of, like, the, the kind of stories that I tell, I think, kind of do that. But, like, like oh, like, that sounds weird. Like, that seems like something that he would write about. Like, I think if like, if there's anybody who's read, like, a lot of stuff from our, from our website, like, if they saw it someplace else, just the, like, the, like, oh, that kind of seems like a, his idea. Yeah. But then, like, the, but then when it actually gets into the actual writing of it, I don't know... How much you? I mean, I guess you you've read a lot of my stuff, so I guess you would maybe be able to tell like if it like can like I don't stand out might be the the wrong word, but like differentiator from like any other art writers, you know, way that they tell a story. Your style has kind of like a Kafka or Hemingway uh, nature to it, where it's usually more to the point. And uh, maybe even like a Lovecraft without the crazy vocabulary and, and the thesaurus. And the racism. And the racism. I just wanted to point that without the racism. <laughs> without the racism. Yeah, because your style has kind of a direct to the point. You're just telling the story, so you don't go metaphor heavy. And I, I said Lovecraft because, which I mean, we, we talked about this in the past. I guess you switch between third person or yeah. first person. Like Lovecraft was a lot of first person. So maybe that's not necessarily applicable, or in your early work, I would say. Yeah. Now I would think you go more to like third person. Yeah, too. I do find myself a lot. It, it seems just easier to tell the story that way. Yeah, uh, used to do a lot of first person. Now it's yeah, you switched. Uh, but uh, like I said, like a Hemingway because it's more direct. You don't have like flowery language. You're just kind of telling the story. You don't have things that don't need to be in there. But I feel like maybe Hemingway probably had more dialogue. Yeah. Like, he would have pages and pages of dialogue. You don't go heavy dialogue. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I'd say if somebody read your work, they could tell it was yours. If they, you know, they read enough mm-hmm. of your stuff. Um, my style, I, I think I'm getting to the point where it's pretty unique now. Like, if you read my work, you'd be able to tell it was mine versus someone else. There's a... 
Like, there's a few things I've been kind of ironing out, like, with my storytelling and stuff, but I, th- I think I'm getting there. I, I like your um your ability to, with where it comes to, like, detail and explaining things, but not in a way that it's... um Boring? Boring, or just, like... It's drawn out. Hey, let's move it along. I get it. You're, yeah, let's go to the next thing. See, that's what I took from when I was reading all that Hemingway, and, uh... Because when I was reading that Lovecraft, I experimented with, like, the more flowery language and going into the more drawn-out stuff. But I don't like reading that stuff too much. Like, that's what bores me. So I kind of took from Hemingway is, like, that more direct approach. But, I mean, even maybe, like, uh, Hunter S. Thompson, where I will have some, like, you know, I'll hit the metaphors and things like that. But I don't draw it out. Or try to... uh did set stuff up so you like later on you can hit like a club you have like a little clever like a little clever line about maybe something else that happened like earlier or later like yeah that's that's the most like i ever try to find like what can i do to make like oh that's a nice little clever line like Mm -hmm. that's a little little good thing a dialogue or just a good sentence yeah that's definitely one thing you do is you, you hit those nice little beats that uh keep the story progression progressing and uh like, a lot of writers, they go into info dumps mm. where they'll just tell you backlog of shit that's not... Like, they don't have a good flow. Your stories always seem to progress. Like, they, you know, you start at point A, you get to point Z. Yeah. You don't hit all these fucking other yeah. bullshit. Like, so that's always good. Because a lot it's of like writers... a bullet train. Yeah, because I've read some submissions where people, uh, they, they just too much... Too much side nonsense, and it's just... Like, I don't need... You know, the Dean Koontz, the leaf was crinkly, but then I'm going to explain the veins of the leaf and I'm going to go into the brittleness. It's a fucking leaf. It yeah. has nothing to do with the story. Yeah, Get to it. it. Yeah, it's like if that leaf <laughs> like landed on somebody and murdered them. Like, okay, all right. That, yeah. that might make sense, but if it's just laying there in the background. Yeah, when you focus on the wrong things, that's... Uh... Damn it, that's <laughs> another good segue. Metaphors make great stories. <laughs> We're just getting all over the place. If you're a storyteller, that's why I feel like we're starting to know what we're talking yeah. about. Because when we read these kind of things, like I find like, oh, we're already talking about yeah. the topic at hand. Just trust us. There wasn't much like, it's not like we read through this really. No, I didn't beforehand. look at it. I literally looked at nothing. Just the title. If you're a storyteller, that's what makes a great story. I think the reason my stories have been so successful is that I have a strong sense of metaphor. And that with my stories, you can remember it because I grew up on Greek myths. Roman myths, Egyptian myths, and the Norse Eddas. So when you have influences like that, your metaphors are so strong that people can't forget them. From a 2001 interview with James Hibbard published in Salon. I uh, I do want to spice up my metaphors more. Like I've been focusing on it because uh, you can easily fall into cliche metaphors. So I try to, uh, I, I try to get my metaphors... Uh, Almost like what he said, he'll go into like Greek myths and stuff. I'll try to get you know like burned up like the wings of Icarus, like yeah. things that are a little, little cooler, makes it read better. I mean, I'll put the generic metaphors and similes and all that shit in first as the first draft. I can't think of anything, but yeah. I'll go back and change it. I think yeah, because I feel like that's one thing that a lot of fiction writers could work on is the metaphors, just because it makes it more enjoyable to read. And I, I mean, I haven't read enough of Stephen King yet to know how he goes about that, because he's like a, he's a story focused guy, yeah. which is fine. But there's some writers where I've read the stories actually kind of boring or tame, but because all the metaphors and the the way that it's written it actually just makes you really enjoy it. So you can get away with telling an okay story, but if you, the way you tell it, you've heard like old guys talking to yeah. you know back in the day, they might be telling you a story about. Their buddy got fucking, you know, got in a bar fight and he just got his fucking eye poked out. Yeah. Okay, that's kind of cool, I guess. But the way they tell it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Jimmy. Oh, Jimmy, he was in there. He was he was gizzard shitted. <laughs> like, what does that mean? <laughs> gizzard shitted. Yeah, he was gizzard shitted to the gills, boy. I'll tell you what, howdy. And you know what he done did? He told the bartender he can go suck a butt, and then he stabbed him. Okay. Huh? Like, just the way you could tell a story. That's, that's, you know, I'd rather hear gizzard shit. Than he was drunk. He was in a you bar. Gotta, he was drunk. Your, your next challenge is to put gizzard shit into a story. I'm gonna. I'll do that. I don't know if I can remember it. Gizzard shit. That's a good one. Learn. What, what are we doing here today, Spencer? Are we psychics? Mm. Here's the next one. Learn from the lizards. I think of gizzards when I think of lizards. Yeah. I don't know about you. 
Well, I guess you could think of chickens. Yeah, I think chickens really have gizzards. Just the spelling. They just, yeah, they're just, they, they almost drive is what it is. <laughs> Learn from the lizards. Run fast, stand still. This, the lesson from lizards, for all writers, it's hard to read this because it's like so broken up. Yeah. This, the lesson from lizards, for all writers, what can we writers learn from lizards? Lift from birds. In quickness is truth. The faster you blurt, the more swiftly you write, the more honest you are. In hesitation is... If, in hesitation is thought. In delay comes the effort for a style instead of leaping upon truth, which is the only style worth dead falling or tiger trapping. From run fra- fast, stand still, a bunch of other shit. Um, I don't, I don't know what he's trying to say there. Yeah, so run. I don't know. Wait, wait. I mean, this is a pretty long, long group yeah, of how sayings. Many? So like, they all can't be. Uh... Yeah, we might have to cut this short. There's like eighty more entries yeah. here. I'll just read the titles of some of these, and we'll riff real quick. I'm not. I can't read any more of these. I didn't realize this was so long. Yeah, because we're already at the fucking 50-minute mark. Uh, duh, duh, duh. Study the work of masters. But, I agree. But mm-hmm. only... But next one. But only the old ones. Again, that depends on, like, um... If you if you want to be like a like a sci-fi writer, if that's, like, your main focus and you just want to write sci-fi... There now, granted, there's a there's a lot of great old sci-fi out there, but I'm sure that there's probably still like not I, as old. You know, I I mean I don't know. I mean I would say this um I would say this works if you're thinking about old writers as in they're not really going to go out of style because it's already established. Yeah. Okay. So you read a Lovecraft, you're getting a Lovecraft story. You're not gonna like Lovecraft's not going to suddenly write a new story that's completely different. Like you know, it's already cemented what he wrote. And also, um, I mean, it's hard for me to talk about this particular topic because I read so much yeah. old literature. I don't really read modern fiction as much. But what would you say about, like, because, um, like, I would think I would consider, like, Neil Gaiman a master. Yeah, that's what but I was would you, thinking. would you say that he's an old ma- Like, granted, he's been doing it for, like, 20, 30 years, something like that, right? I would say so- him and Stephen King are old enough now that they have things that would be considered classics. I mean, maybe they're considered modern classics, but I would say, you know, even like American Gods is kind of a classic, and that's what, like, maybe 20 years old, not even? Yeah. Yeah, I would, I think maybe the takeaway from that one is when it comes to reading the work of masters, if you're reading modern masters, that might impact your style too much, it might influence you too much because you want to write like them, I, yeah. I'm not sure. You don't become a writer by taking writing classes, agree. I thought about doing that back in the day, but I find the most boring, pedantic writers are those who take a lot of write, creative writing yeah. classes and stuff. Because how do you teach creativity? Especially now, it'd be like one thing, like you know, like you're in high school and you're the, you have a writing it's class. And, yeah. yeah, that's different. You're still young. You're forming. But we're both in our thirties to go and take like a writing class. That just seems. Uh, I feel like if somebody is teaching you how to be creative and write, then you're following a formula and you're not being yourself. You should be your authentic self. I mean, you're really, maybe, not, you're really not being creative. Yeah, I mean, that's why I even shied away from like Neil Gaiman. He had the master class yeah. and they had R.L. Stein and uh, what's his face? Patterson. You know what? They did have one that you might would have to check out just for the batshit craziness of it is the... um. Oh, uh... Gary Busey? No, uh... <laughs> acting? Oh, uh, what's his name from, uh... That did Tw- Twin Peaks and all that stuff. David Lynch? Oh, yeah, that, he did, I, I guess that. I guess he did one. Directing. And, and that would just be... Well, I think he writes a lot of his stuff, too, like... Well, the master classes are on all topics, not oh, just okay. writing. Yeah, okay. there's a lot. I think his was on directing, they have acting. I mean, that would just be interesting. How just to be to, bat shit insane? Yeah, <laughs> just to be fucking out there. Yeah, but I, the only reason, because they had a special one, I think I could have got it like for free or 10 bucks or something, like the master class. But I was worried that if I took that, because it's like five, five hours long, yeah. I was worried if I took that, then all of a sudden I'm going to kind of be writing like Neil Gaiman. See, I, I think that if you're going to watch something like that, it would have to be more in a mindset of, I'm watching this for more of an entertainment. Yeah. You know, like, I really like Neil Gaiman. I, I like his work. He, I like watching, like, interviews that he's in and, and things like that. So I think it would just be kind of cool 
to listen to him for a couple hours shoot the shit about writing. How to, about writing his process and not so much of like ooh sitting there with like a notepad trying to take notes and stuff like that. Well, I don't think the master classes would even be that bad in regards to what I'm talking about because creative writing classes, you're writing and then you're getting judged by the teacher on your writing. Who and, like and who 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 knows what the fuck that he's like? Who gives him the you know? Yeah, and even if he's like an established you know famous writer or something it's your story so is he gonna tell i mean it's one thing to say okay this isn't that good or here's where you kind of messed up or something but you know say you're just uh like you know we're talking about styles what if your style's just not for him yeah he's gonna tell you to change it and then you're gonna be you know him or her is telling you to change it then you're gonna be blocked into like i feel like you're gonna kind of be writing however they're telling you to write versus how you write and that's why i think creative writing classes are they might be worth attending just to see what it's like, but I don't think I would take it too seriously. There, this does, like, if I knew I was going to do this, I really wish, like, in high school I would took some kind of, uh, uh, like, writing, like, you know, a creative writer, which I don't even know if they had in our school, to no, be honest they, with you. No, I would have took it. They didn't. Because just to be like, because you know they'd have some kind of curriculum and just be like, no, I'm going to write this, teacher. You're going to have to read this. Yeah. Like, You're going to have to read my fan fiction. I do wish I would have paid attention more in English class. Oh. Because it took a long time for me to learn all the writing rules that oh, I should have known yeah. since middle school. Yeah. But, you know, you ask me about prepositions and stuff, and I'll just look at you dumbfounded, like, wait a minute. I'll have to think, wait, what is that again? Like, mm-hmm. I, I don't fucking. Prep a what? I, I think I do a pretty solid job of editing now, but I don't think I would uh, be very good in a professional environment no. where you're supposed to know some shit. Um, right when the idea strikes, I write down the ideas usually. Yeah. Like, I don't let them just fall to the wayside and think I'll get to them later. But, uh, again, I'm not reading this anymore. So I would say if you have the time, obviously, yeah. well, I, you know what? Everybody has the time to, if idea strikes you, to at least be like, jot down your phone oh, yeah, def- yeah, yeah, definitely. Unless you're like get- a heart surgeon or something, most likely you can, even if you're at work, Fucking cut to the side for five yeah. seconds just to write down like topic points. Yeah, even if it's just like in a text message or something, and don't yeah. send like send it to yourself or something. Yeah, whatever you gotta do, just get a note feature on your phone. That's what I do. I do that all the time. Actually, I'll be driving, I'll get an idea, I'll pull over and actually, mm. you know, write down some stuff real quick. Go your own way. That goes what we were talking about creative writing, where it's kind of your style. I mean, you want again, you want to know the rules of writing. Maybe you want to know how to be able to tell a good story for you know start to finish but you gotta do it your own way yeah because why if you're doing it somebody else's way why is somebody reading you they can read somebody else if you're gonna write like stephen king i'll just fucking read, read, read stephen king i think dan coons had that problem yeah i think uh joe hill probably had that problem for a while which is why he was joe hill not yeah. joe king is because he didn't want to be like his dad i mean not that it was a bad thing he just wanted to uh he wanted his own he wanted to be his own writer which is why like he did lock and key and stuff oh yeah he kind of he did it an original way Practice word association. Uh, I'm not going into that. Take off the safety harness. You've got to jump off the cliff all the time and build your wings on the way down. That's not very... I guess that's kind of just saying... um, just try dive or, into your writing and like, maybe try writing like you might not know about uh like you you might not be a good thriller. Realize right? you might fail, but yeah. you're trying it anyway. Yeah. Live dangerously, my yeah. friends. Uh, write only for yourself. That's a good way. If you're writing to make other people happy, you'll never succeed. Write the stories that you want to read. Again, it's your stories. So if you're writing what you want, usually you're writing a story because it's not out there. Yeah. That's why I hate a lot of uh, YA. No, hate it, but you know, you I have hate. a s- strong disdain for hate. a lot of YA writers is because they're writing stories that are already told and they're just telling it maybe different or so with different the, characters so but. that the, the 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 next group of young kids who the, the, you know the one the one kids they grew up already and they get this fresh batch that you can just hit them with the same story because they don't know yeah that's not cool be original so i would say tell your stories that you'd like to read because it's not on the market yeah. use every experience that touches you mm. um I would say any experience. I don't. I wouldn't say every experience. I mean, there's a lot of things that touch me. That yeah. Are, no, no, I mean, I get what he's saying. You know, you have a heartfelt the, moment in your well, life or and something. We, and we've talked about this before to to kind of be a good writer. You kind of you have to go out there. You got to do some shit. You gotta you gotta live. Yeah. You gotta 
do some. I mean, look at Hunter H. Thompson. Like, <laughs> right. you don't want to go that bad, but you know, I, he definitely has some things he could write about. Well, for instance, say you uh, like, there's a lot of small things in your day. I think this is what that's more touching on. Is there's a lot of small things in your day that you probably ignore, or I mean, it's something like. Say you're at work, you're having a bad day, and like a customer was just like a little extra nice to you, and that kind of made you feel good. That's something you're just like, oh, that's cool, and you can probably forget about it, and that's the end of that. But if you actually work, you could work that into your writing. Yeah. Maybe, you know, that's a character development or a way to show a character as emotion, things like that. You can work all these little moments of your day into your stories. Uh, indulge in your own personal madness. I do that all the time. Sometimes it's very detrimental, but whatever. Detrimental. Don't be afraid to cut. Yes, don't. You got to cut, man. Yeah. Somet- I've cut sentences and paragraphs that I loved. Mm-hmm. I thought it was brilliant and I wanted to lick it and taste it and make sweet, sweet love to it. But you know what? I had to cut it because it didn't fit the story. And, and, and you know what you do, maybe? Use it in another story. Yeah, just copy paste that son of a bitch, put it in a blank, keep it there, and then you might be able to repurpose it for something. Not for primetime ideas. Where you go, like Saturday Night Live, people that are the prime, you know, you got the prime time players, and then you got the guys that are just bit role players until they move on up. That idea doesn't get checked, it just gets moved to the side till yeah. it's ready. Gotta let it, uh, marinate. I was gonna say ferment, but that's a little gross. Yeah, I guess marinate's <laughs> the word. Uh, don't be afraid to write crap either. Well, yeah, gotta write yeah, some poo poo. It's not all gonna be good. It's good. That goes with the writing a short story every week. Not all gonna be good. Yeah. I, we, we've had <laughs> a lot of stinkers we put out. Yep. Get comfortable with the idea of work, obviously, and you'll never really have to do it, of course, if you, like we were talking about the routines, if you get to the point where writing every day is something, or not writing just every day, but consistently, is something that you end up, uh, you do it so much that it's not a chore anymore and you start to enjoy it. Yeah. So that's a good thing. Surround yourself with true believers. Give her to those friends of yours who make fun of you and don't believe in you. Fucking right. When yeah, you're harder said than done. Or not necessarily. Gotta have friends it, first. <laughs> it, it, it's not uh it's not so much difficult getting rid of those people, it's difficult finding those people to begin with. Yeah. Well, this goes with I was thinking about maybe doing an episode about this, but I'm not sure. But talking about uh it was like a tweet I did the other day that was super popular. About, uh, just want to sound like a douche. Super popular Super. here, but no, it did. It got like way more interaction than I expected. It was like fucking 300 hearts and all this shit. I was like, Jesus. Like, I had to interact with all these people for like five <laughs> hours about it. But it was about, um, like close family and friends not reading yeah. your work and stuff. It's, it's hard when you're a writer because, again, not everybody's a reader, which is fine. Yeah. You know, people don't like reading. You're, they might support that you write, but they're not going to want to read your stuff because they just don't like reading. Yeah. That's fine. But, like, the people that, you know, just don't give a shit, they just, oh, yeah, how's your little hobby coming? <laughs> that You're getting face-stabbed for me if you say, how's your little hobby coming? I'm, I hate that shit. It's like, if it was a hobby, I wouldn't be spending all this fucking money on right. podcast equipment and learning shit. And it's only a hobby until all of a sudden you make it, and then they're sucking your ball sack. Because yeah. they're like, oh, you're a famous writer. That's what they, like, you know, they say the, uh, the, over, the overnight success that took 30 Ten, years yeah. to make. Really? Write a little every day. Yep. Yes, got to do that. Yep. Live in the goddamn library. Um, mm. That was from the 2001 symposium. So you don't got to do that anymore because no, you got the internet. Just get yourself a Kindle. Yeah, or get something. a Kindle. Or whatever, you know. Internet. Old school jukebox. I don't know what I'm mm. saying. And in the end, I have three rules to live by. One, get your work done. If that doesn't work, shut up and drink your gin. And when all else fails, run like hell. Okay. I'm all good until the running bit. You don't want the athleticism associated with running because your cardio sucks or you yeah. just don't want to run away? It's, well, it's just it's an all-around laziness of... Right. And then, too, you don't want to be going running after you have that gin. Oh, no. Yeah, this, that's all else fails. is running with lots of gin in your body. You're going to be mm. tore the fuck up. So what's your takeaway from this? Anything deep and worth telling? Uh, just that I think that he brought up, you know, a lot of great points. And the things that, you know, the things he was talking about, are most of them are things that you should take into your writing, you know, that can help you. Oh, I agree. Again, folks, if you want to check out this article in greater detail and be able to, uh, you know, go into what we weren't able to cover or actually read the because my terrible 
fucking rendition it probably doesn't come across as good as the actual article you can go to fucking jiggle 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 butt sick no <laughs> sorry i always hit this fucking thing you can go to lithub.com backslash ray bradbury yeah i'm not reading all that so lithub.com it's called ray bradbury's greatest writing advice by emily temple and uh it's a very good article yes. Ms. temple i yes Thank you for re- – we should start – I wish I can find because they never have the fucking links to their social media, and I can never find them when I search. Wait, she might. I didn't look at the bottom. Uh, no, it just has her, her biography, which sucks. Um, Not her biography, but the fact that she no, doesn't that's No, the fact that she doesn't have uh, the social media links because I want to find these people. Like, hey, I really liked your article. Yeah. We're going to put it in the pocket. I would love to do that, but so far I never can find anybody's fucking links. And we're not going to go searching for you. Yeah, I'm not going to search that hard. That's work. We'll just use your stuff. We don't yeah. make money off of this anyway. So it's like, especially when we start making money off the podcast, then I'm definitely going to do that because I'm not stealing people's shit. Yeah. But as we don't make any money, we're pretty much just sending people to the article. But anyway, check that out because that was a great article. And if you love writing as much as we do, you will want to take some knowledge away from Mr. Ray Bradbury because he knew what the hell he was doing. That he did. All right. You folks, take it easy on... We'll be over here drinking and stuff. Drinking. Getting that purple drink. What, 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 what. So anyway, I was in this bar, right? (laughs) And this guy was shit gizzard gizzard shitted. (laughs) Oh, wow. That was double the fucked up. And he was at the bar, right? And the bartender slid him a, a you know, a, a shot. No, oh, no, 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 no. Hey. Slid him a, he slid him a shot, right? Got down the shot. Hey, this ain't the bourbon I ordered. This is vodka, you grimy fuck. Bartender didn't like that talk too much. No, he did. No, he did. No, he did. What he did? What he did? Told him kindly, get out of my bar after paying your tab. Get on here. Get on out. And you know what the drunk did? The shit gives her drunk. He got on out. Paid his tab and he got on out. After he poked some dude's eye out. <laughs>